Hello, my name's Christopher Joel, and I'm the regimental historian of the Household Cavalry. Now, over the coming weeks, I'm going to be trying to lighten the gloom that's all around us by recounting some extraordinary stories about our regiments that you've probably never heard before. Because, you see, the Household Cavalry is not just about boots and saddles. And in the immortal words of Michael Caine... That is not many people know that. This week, in the second podcast in the series... I'm going to recount an extraordinary story about the amputated limb of one of the most distinguished members of the Royal Horse Guards, otherwise known as the Blues, Lord Uxbridge's leg. Until the advent of counselling for every adverse occasion, there was no characteristic more admired by the British than the preservation of a stiff upper lip in the face of adversity. Consequently, one of the more memorable historical conversations, cherished by posterity for its very British sang-froid, took place by La Haye-Sainte Farmhouse on the battlefield of Waterloo on Sunday the 18th of June 1815. It was a brief exchange between the British cavalry commander, General Henry Paget, 2nd Earl of Uxbridge, later Field Marshal the 1st Marquess of Anglesey, and the Allied Commander-in-Chief, Field Marshal, the Duke of Wellington. At around 8pm, as the battle was drawing to a close, a French canister shot narrowly missed the Iron Duke, but struck the right knee of his cavalry commander, who was riding next to him. "'By God, sir, I've lost my leg!' exclaimed Uxbridge. "'By God, sir, so you have!' replied Wellington. An alternative version, recorded by the diarist J.W. Croker, a friend of Wellington's from whom he heard the story, states, "'I've got it at last!' cried Uxbridge. "'No, have you by God?' said Wellington. Either way, Uxbridge was clearly hors de combat. Initially supported in the saddle by Wellington, a short while later Uxbridge, still in situ on his horse, was led towards the rear by one of his aides-de-camp, Captain Seymour. It wasn't long before the ADC spotted a party of six Hanoverian soldiers whom he ordered to lift the cavalry commander from off his charger and carry the wounded aristocrat back to his billet at La Maison Tremblant, 21 Chaussée de Bruxelles, in the village of Waterloo, diametrically opposite Wellington's own headquarters at number 147. Once back at the unfortunately named house, the imperturbable Earl was placed on a chair. After a brief discussion with the doctors, his leg was amputated above the knee, without anaesthetic, by Wellington's personal surgeon, Dr John Hume, who had just removed one of Colonel Gordon's lower limbs. Hume was assisted in the bloody task by surgeons James Powell and James Callender. Uxbridge, who as well as having nerves of steel, was also a notorious philanderer, retained his calm during the gruesome operation remarking to another of his ADCs, Captain Thomas Wildman, as he looked dispassionately at his bloody stump. I've had a pretty long run. I've been a beau these 47 years, and it would not be fair to cut the young men out any longer. Other accounts added that Uxbridge complained that the surgeon's tools appeared to be rather blunt when the amputation saw got stuck midway through the general's thigh bone. Once the operation was over, Uxbridge calmly asked one of his cavalry subordinates, Major General Sir Hussey Vivian, if the severed leg had in fact been serviceable. Vivian examined the shattered limb and was able to report back that it was completely spoiled for work, my lord, which satisfied its former owner. Serviceable or not, the severed leg soon took on a life of its own, whilst its former owner commissioned a series of prosthetic replacements. For his leadership at Waterloo, and possibly his bravery afterwards, Uxbridge was advanced to the Marquisate of Anglesey, appointed a Knight of the Garter and a full general. Later, in an unpopular move with the public, he supported the divorce proceedings against Queen Caroline. Later still, without public opposition, Anglesey was appointed to the Cabinet, as Master General of the Ordnance, the political post of Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, and the prestigious but honorary Colonel C of the Royal Horse Guards. 
I want to return listeners now to La Maison Tremblant, uh, at some point pretentiously redesignated as a chateau in the centre of Waterloo. It was a small, plain-fronted, stuccoed and white-painted house adjacent to the church of the Chapelle Royale in the centre of the town and was owned by the fragrantly named Monsieur Hyacinth Paris, who was still in residence at the time of the battle. Once the amputation had been completed, Paris asked Uxbridge if he could bury the severed leg in the front garden of the house and was readily given consent. In due course, the butchered relic was placed in a grave next to a willow tree and Monsieur Paris commissioned the local stonemason to carve a tombstone on which were engraved, in English and French, the following words. Here lies the leg of the illustrious and valiant Earl of Uxbridge, Lieutenant General of His Britannic Majesty, Commander-in-Chief of the English, Belgian and Dutch Cavalry, wounded on the 18th of June 1815 at the memorable Battle of Waterloo, who, by his heroism, assisted in the triumph of the cause of mankind, gloriously decided by the resounding victory of the said day. Doubtless keen to recover his cos, and knowing a good thing when he buried it, the wily Belgian turned his garden into a tourist attraction which was visited, on a paying basis over the next 60 years or so, by kings, princes, a fair sprinkling of the Almanac de Gotha and de Bretz, and morbidly curious crowds of the great unwashed. In consequence, the buried leg provided a steady income for several generations of the Paris family, as well as occasioning reams of verse by Prime Minister George Canning and others, and attracting some ribald graffiti that made reference to Uxbridge's raunchy past. Here lies the Marquis of Anglesey's limb. The devil will have the remainder of him. However, in time all good things come to an end. In the case of the Legs burial site in La Maison Tremblant's garden, Nemesis arrived in 1878 in the shape of the second Marquis of Anglesey. Asking to view the tombstone, he was horrified to discover that his father's leg had been disinterred and that the shattered bones were on display to the general public in the Paris's front parlour. In the days that followed, the leg bones became the centre of a major diplomatic incident. The British ambassador to the Belgian court, who had been tasked by the British government with establishing the facts and recovering the remains, reported that the leg had been exposed when a violent storm had uprooted the willow tree next to the tomb, and that the Paris family would be willing to repatriate the relic in return for a substantial payment. Before a second Battle of Waterloo could develop, the Belgian Minister of Justice intervened and ordered that the Earl's severed appendage be reburied, an arrangement agreed to by the leg's original owner's heir. That, however, was by no means the end of the story. In 1934, the last Monsieur Paris died in Brussels. Whilst sorting through his effects, the widow Paris discovered in her late husband's desk Uxbridge's leg bones, along with documentation supporting their provenance. Petrified at the prospect of a scandal, she consigned the remains to a fiery end in her central heating furnace. Meanwhile, the leg's tombstone found its way down the main street of Waterloo to Chaussée de Bruxelles 147, now the home of the Wellington Museum, where it leans against a wall in the backyard. Inside the museum is the blood-stained chair on which the leg was amputated and one of its prosthetic replacements. The surgeon's leather glove, still covered in the Earl's gore, and the saw that was used in the operation are to be found in the National Army Museum, London, and the other two surviving artificial limbs are on display at the Anglesey's family home, Place Neuid, and the Household Cavalry Museum in London. <laughs>